In meditation you are not trying to change your experience, you are changing your relationship to your experience. When this unification occurs, there's a simplicity to life, a deep sense of freedom and essential well-being and also a fearlessness. Where there was abiding tranquility, what awakens now is sense of an extraordinary vitality, of life force. It's as if the fullness of your being is radiating, and from the tips of your toes to the top of your head, you feel this very deep and powerful radiance. Someone came to me and said, Adia I will try to explain what happened experientially. At the moment of awakening, it was as though I was completely outside who I thought I was. There was a vast, vast, vast emptiness. In that vast emptiness, in that infinite emptiness, there was the smallest, smallest, smallest point of light you could imagine. And then I noticed there were all sorts of other points, points, and I could enter each one of those points, and each one of those points was a different world, a different time, and I was a different person, a totally different manifestation in each one of those points. I could go into each one of them and see a totally different dream of self and a totally different world that was being dreamed as well. For the most part, what I saw was anything that was unresolved about the dream of me in a particular lifetime. There were certain confusions, fears, hesitations, and doubts that were unresolved in particular lifetimes. In certain lifetimes, what was unresolved was a feeling of confusion about what happened at the time of death. In one lifetime, I drowned and did not know what was happening, and there was tremendous terror and confusion as the body disappeared into the water. Seeing this lifetime and the confusion at the moment of death, I immediately knew what I had to do. I had to rectify the confusion and explain to the dream of me that I died, that I fell off a boat and drowned. When I did this, all of a sudden the confusion from that lifetime popped like a bubble, and there was a tremendous sense of freedom. Many past life dreams appeared, and each one of them seemed to focus on something that had been in conflict, something that was unresolved from a different incarnation. I went through each one of them and unhooked the confusion. T.S. Were you lying on a carpeted floor with your eyes closed, or something? A.D.Y.A. No, actually, the strangest thing was that, I was walking across the living room when all of this happened. I can't tell you how long I was walking. It could have been five seconds, because all of this is outside of time, I don't actually know. I could have been walking across the living room floor for five hours, but I was, literally, just walking across the living room. And it's not like I stood still, I was walking, and it all happened right in the midst of what I was doing. I walked across the living room, I went into the backyard, I was doing something, I don't even remember what I was doing, and simultaneously this whole other thing was happening, too. I know it sounds odd. This didn't happen in a moment of meditation, it was completely mixed in as a part of ordinary life. As you know, I haven't talked much about this, in order to find what the concept of God is pointing to, you must let go of your image of God and every concept you have about God. You must dare to be void of all concepts and enter into perfect emptiness, perfect stillness, and perfect silence. You must forget everything you have ever learned about God. It won't help you. It may comfort you, but such comfort is imaginary, it is an illusion. Let go of all the false comforts of the mind. Let them all come to an end. The end must be experienced fully in stillness. When you let all images, all concepts, all hopes, and all beliefs end, stillness is experienced. Experience the core of stillness. Dive into it and surrender fully. In full surrender to stillness, you directly experience that to which the concept of God points. In that direct experience, you awaken from the dream of the mind and realize that the concept of God points to who you truly are, kind of thing. I don't want to talk to a lot of people about past lives, especially the radical non-dualists who say that there is nobody who was born, there is nobody who has past lives, there are no incarnations, and so on. Of course, that is all true, it's all a dream, even past lives. When I talk about them at all, I talk about them as past dreams. 
I dreamed I was this person, I dreamed I was that person. Personally, I've never tried to gather experiences of past lives and wrap them all up in some sort of metaphysical understanding. I don't have a clear understanding about what a past life is, except that it seems clear to me that it also has the nature of a dream, it doesn't have objective, actual existence. Nonetheless, the experience I had happened. Since it happened, I can't say it didn't happen. But in my own mind, I don't try to figure it all out. All I know is what happened. Was there a sense when you looked at each of these dreams that there was some kind of resolution occurring? I asked him, Adia, yes. Not only a resolution there, but also a resolution now. Because it's all one thing. Because anything that was unresolved in one of those dreams was unresolved now. Because it's the same, there's a connection. One of the reasons I haven't talked much about past lives is that some people who are extraordinarily awake have never seen a past life at all. Being aware of past lives is not a necessity. I'm not a particularly mystical person. There was a relatively short period of time, a few months, when I had these kinds of experiences happen occasionally, and since then, every now and then, but not with any great consistency. So they don't need to happen, it's just that they did. In ancient times, people having this experience entered protected environments such as monasteries, places where those around them would understand. They'd be put in a nice little cell and left alone to let the process happen, they were fortunate to experience awakening in a context in which it was understood, seen as normal, and given the space it required. In today's society, most of us having these realizations are not living in monasteries, we are not in a particularly supportive environment. In fact, in our society it is possible to have an amazing realization on Saturday and be back in the office on Monday morning. If your mind is still blown out in bliss, this can be very disorienting. Yet it's the reality of the situation we live in. Most modern people don't have the luxury of sitting in a cave for a few months and letting things shake down naturally. This is the state of our world, and it can be a challenge for some people. Part of the reason I am bringing up the topic of past lives is that I've heard several people say something like this about you. Adia must have been a realized being in a past life, and that's why he's had such tremendous breakthroughs at such an early age and is able to articulate teachings on awakening in such an original way. What do you think about that comment, Adia? If you ask me point blank, then yes, I've seen myself doing something similar to what I'm doing in this lifetime many times before. But again, I don't know the whole metaphysics of past lives and how they work, and I don't see things happening in terms of linear cause and effect. In fact, my experience of past lives isn't that they are actually past. I call them that, because that's how people relate to them. But if I were to say what my real experience is, it's more like simultaneous lives, myth carries not fact, not history, but truth, the ultimate reality. The Jesus story carries this ultimate reality, and that's why, 2000 years later, it remains so compelling. Otherwise spirituality and our daily life become two separate things. That's the primary illusion that there is something called my spiritual life, and something called my daily life. When we wake up to reality, we find they are all one thing. It's all one seamless expression of spirit. Consciousness, or your true nature, is allowing everything to be as it is. I have found that one of the keys to really being free is to live in the same way as you meditate. If you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. Before I wonder why I am here, maybe I should find out who this I is who is asking the question. Before I ask what is God, maybe I should ask who I am, this I who is seeking God. Who am I, who is actually living this life? Who is right here, right now? Who is on the spiritual path? Who is it that is meditating? Who am I really? Whatever thoughts you have about yourself aren't who and what you are. 
There is something more primary that is watching the thoughts. There exists only the present instant, a now which always and without end is itself new. Words of Meister Eckhart, it's good to be reminded that hubris, left unchecked, can have serious consequences in our lives. If we don't notice soon enough, we might just realize too late that we've lost some very important things in our lives. The beauty of this story is that it reminds us, keep your feet firmly planted on the soil, keep your consciousness and your heart open, and stay available to this relative world and all the human beings within it. It's the way spirit moves in the world of time and space. That's what a human body-mind is, an extension of spirit in time and space. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John, chapter 1 verse 1, the beginning of the spiritual journey is what I call life after awakening. Jesus said, I am the light above everything. I am everything. Everything came forth from me, and everything reached me. Gospel of Thomas 77, now, that's as clearly as the enlightened state can be put into words. I am the light of everything, the light of divine being, the light of consciousness. I am what lights up the world, I am what sees the world, and that seeing, that consciousness is actually what gives rise to the world. In some spiritual traditions, just to be the divine, eternal witness of all of life is enough, it's the goal. But in the spirituality of Jesus, that's not the goal. He doesn't say only, I am the light above everything but I am everything, everything came forth from me. In the original Greek, one of the meanings of sin, hamartia, is simply to miss the mark. Now, imagine you've gone to confession, and the priest says to you, confess your sins. Imagine that this priest even accuses you of being a sinner, imagine how that would feel in your mind and heart, to be considered a moral failure. Now imagine instead how you'd feel if that priest were to say, so, tell me, how have you missed the mark in your life? There's an enormous difference in how these two interpretations of sin are held in our hearts, in our minds, in our bodies. If we understand that sin means to miss the mark, it's not so personal and damning. Once again, eternity is peering through the latticework of time and space. And this sense of eternal stillness and deep freedom is what the iconic image of the seated Buddha conveys. What this image doesn't convey is a sense of humanity, of a real flesh and blood human being. But in the Jesus story, it's as if the still point that the image of the Buddha evokes within us becomes, the Gospel of Thomas presents the kingdom of heaven as something that exists right here and right now. In fact, it's all about what's right here and right now. In it, we find Jesus saying, The kingdom of the Father is spread out upon the earth, and men do not see it. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. It is useful to reflect on what happiness is. The Sierra Nevada mountain range near Lake Tahoe is one of the most beautiful spots in the world. Some of my best memories of my youth are of time spent there. Some of the mountains are high for North America, 14,000 foot peaks, and it is difficult, rugged terrain, but powerful and gorgeous. In my 20s, I would go up to the John Muir Trail and backpack for weeks, even months, absorbed in silence and the absolute majesty of the environment. The mountains were my religious temple, I called them my cathedral. They were a place of great inspiration, peace, and stillness. I have always felt connected to those mountains. A couple of years ago, I was driving up there by myself to do a retreat. It takes about four hours to get to the Sierras from where I live. As soon as I reached the foothills, I laughed loudly and deeply for a good ten minutes with the joyousness of being back in those mountains. I have been to other places that are beautiful and profound, wildernesses that I enjoy immensely, but nothing is like the Sierras for me. Part of the beauty of being in the mountains, especially when you are backpacking, is that it is a serious place to be, especially if you are up there alone and weeks away from any road. You must take care of yourself. You cannot be casual about it, as you cannot afford to break an ankle, it could be a long time before someone comes by. 
Even though these wild spaces are beautiful and sacred and brimming with a feeling of the divine, you are not in a playground. It is part of the intensity of the experience that you are out by yourself, far from any help. The beautiful thing about going into the real wild areas of the world is you enter them on their terms, and if you do not, they may wipe you out.